Good morning. I'm Alan Ladman from the Office of Communication. Welcome to the special Valentine's Day edition of our astronaut presentations. We have three astronauts today who served on the International Space Station uh, that are going to be telling you about their adventures in space. Uh, those of you that brought me chocolates, I'll be waiting for it outside the door after this is over. Uh, it's been a busy week here at NASA. For all those people that seem to think NASA has gone out of business because the shuttles no longer fly, uh, I don't know who they talk to. I'm, I'm busier than can be, and I know all of you are as well. This has been a particularly busy week because of the rollout of the president's fiscal year 2013 budget yesterday. Uh, we had a, a big rollout here with the press conference for the administrator and Beth Robinson, our chief financial officer. That was followed by press conferences with each of the mission directorates. And, um, and now this week, uh, Lori Garber, our deputy, is, uh, was down at uh, Marshall yesterday, uh, is on her way to Langley this week. Charlie Bolden, our administrator, is out at Goddard today. He's going to Kennedy at the end of the week. And within the next, uh, within two weeks, they plan to visit all the centers to have all-hand briefings to talk about the budget and what to expect in the year ahead. Uh, also, Charlie will be speaking at the Space Club uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, this is kind of an annual tradition where the first uh, outside group that the administrator talks to about the budget is the Space Club. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, at the same time, a lot of us are very busy getting ready for the preparation and the arrival of the Discovery Orbiter out at the Udvar Hazy Museum or Udvar Hazy Center of the National Air and Space Museum. And that'll be arriving on April. Uh, I want to say the 17th with the ceremony of uh, the transfer on o April 19th, and we'll actually have Discovery and the Enterprise nose to nose in a ceremony out there at Dulles. And then that following Monday, Enterprise heads up to the Intrepid Museum in New, New York. So a lot of activities going on. Also, later this month, we've got uh, three different activities to commemorate the 50th anniversary of John Glenn's first orbital flight. Uh, back in 1962. So with that, we have three astronauts today with us, and they have a busy week. Uh, Ron Guerin is going to be tweet, doing a tweet up this afternoon. Uh, Katie Coleman and um, uh, Mike Fossum are going to be uh, leaving here uh, after lunch, going over to the Air and Space Museum. They're all speaking tonight at the University of Maryland to students out there. They're spending a day on the Hill tomorrow to talk to congressmen and senators about NASA's activities. They have an event at the Norwegian Embassy. They're doing a presentation for employees at the Agency for International Development. So they have a very busy week while they are here, and we run them pretty hard. But we're glad they came to share their adventures with us today. Uh, we've got kind of a unique group today. They're all three Air Force colonels, or retired. Uh, so this must be driving the Navy astronauts crazy to have uh, just an Ast uh, Air Force crew here today. Uh, we've got Mike Fossum of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He went to Texas A&M, Air Force Institute of Technology in the University of Houston. He became an astronaut in 1998. He flew on STS-121 in 2006, STS-124 in 2008, and was the commander of Expedition 29. Uh, in 2000, last year, I think it was. Uh, we also have Ron Guerin, another former Air Force Colonel uh, from Yonkers, New York. He attended Sony at the College of Oneonta, uh, Emory Riddle, and the University of Florida. He served in Operation Desert Storm. He was selected as a, a NASA pilot in July of 2000. He flew um, along with Michael on STS-124 and was on Expedition 27 and 28. And then Katie Coleman, or Katie Coleman, uh, from South Carolina, actually went to school here locally at W.T. Woodson High School in Fairfax. She also went to MIT and the University of Massachusetts, uh, joined NASA in uh, 1992, and uh, was on STS-73, STS-93, and on Expedition 26 and 27. She will be forever remembered in popular culture as a flautist, and she played a duet when she was on the space station with uh, Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull. And for all you young whippersnappers, that was one of the great bands of the 60s. So uh, we have uh, uh, photographs of each of the astronauts is on a table just outside here in the uh, hallway that has already been 
uh, autograph for you. So please feel free to pick one of those up. And with that, let's all please give a big NASA headquarters welcome to Mike Fossum. Hi, thank you very much. Just, we're, we're all excited to be here today. You've got, uh, I guess, uh, three colonels all uh, lined up in a row here, Air Force colonel type. So yeah, I think the Navy guys uh, were, uh, were sleeping when all the uh, sequential assignments were being made. It, that are they're smart enough not to get locked in a can for half a year. <laughs> they get that out of their system as uh, submariners them, and stuff. Of uh, we re actually rec uh, represent a total of uh, one year, a complete year on the ISS right here with Katie launching last December 16th, uh, just barely the 16th as I recall. And uh, uh, Ron launched in uh, April, April 12th, oh, yes. 6th, yes. yeah. Yes. And then, uh, when, uh, when it was time for Katie to come home, I took her place up there. So we kind of tagged uh, figuratively. She was landing, uh, we were going through the final launch preparations and then I got home just uh, the, end of, the end of the year. And so we're really excited to, uh, to come to Washington today and to uh, NASA headquarters to say thanks to all of the people here that helped make this possible, that have worked for so many decades on the International Space Station program and to now really see it uh, come into life and not, not just coming to life, but to see it done. And that uh, in the last year, it's been a really huge thing as we've completed the assembly phase of the ISS and moved into uh, the full utilization now that it's built and it all works. And we worked so hard for so many years on all of the unknowns associated with getting it ready and each sequential step in the build. And it's done, it's really done. And it's an amazing place. Anybody else wanna say? Well, we're going to show you uh, a short film that kind of combines that year on the ISS and, you know, can't possibly show you everything we did, but I, we're hoping that it gives you a flavor of what it's like to live up there because there's, there's working, but there's also just living, you know, 24 hours a day. And as you see this film, think of our crew that is our crews, two crews that are up there right now, six people, you know, living up there, doing science. And, you know, for me, if I could have packed up my whole family and brought them, and I'm actually taking this quote from Don Pettit, who's up there, uh, I would have brought them. I mean, there's actually no reason for people not to live there just all the time. And I think all of us are in line to go back. <laughs> well, it's, it's really exciting to be here, like Mike said, you know, and Katie, that we want to come out here and, and thank everybody for the, for the tremendous support that, uh, that the whole space program gets. And, um, you know, we, we were part of history, uh, we being everybody in this room and everybody at headquarters and everybody at all the centers and every, everybody who had anything to do with the space shuttles and the space station. Um, we basically saw that transition from, first of all, the construction of the International Space Station and full utilization of the space station, uh, the construction phase and the payback on investment phase, if you will, where we are getting uh, tremendous payback through the scientific research that is full speed right now. Uh, so we saw that. We also saw the closing of a chapter in our space program's history in the uh, retirement of the space shuttle. Um, but we really felt, uh, as we witnessed that uh, firsthand, that we were also watching the opening of a new chapter that will hopefully see us going beyond low, low Earth orbit and uh, exploring the rest of the solar system. So uh, that's a, that was really exciting to be a part of that, uh, that little piece of history. So um, I think we're ready to start. Well, let me just give a quick preface for it. I mean, you see our patches up here behind us, and that's... Uh, Katie went up and joined Expedition 26 on the far left, and she was up there for 26 and 27. When Ron got there, that was the uh, kind of the beginning of the Expedition 27 time frame. And so we each wear, you know, two mission patches. We're there for, you know, two expeditions. That's right. Mm -hmm. And Katie's got them both on her sleeve here. Uh, when Katie left at the end of it, 27, 28 started, and that's when I joined Ron. Uh, and then I finished up... Uh, with uh, Expedition 29. And so that's why we have the, uh, the four different expedition patches to uh, pretty much cover the year. And 30 picked up uh, as the hatch closed on us. Those guys are still up there. You're yeah. also going to see a lot of uh, kind of coming and going in the film. Yeah. And that's because we're not, is that what you're going to say? No, no. <laughs> but uh, um, that's because the, the crew going up and down is not the only traffic that, that goes on. Um, during our expedition, during 26 and 27, we had a couple progress, the Russian supply missions. We had the Japanese HTVs, the Japanese supply ship, and the European automated transfer vehicles. So those vehicles all came up during 
our tenure there. And so you'll see some of those coming and going, as well as two space shuttle missions, 133 and, uh, well, I was up there, and then when Ron was up there as well, 134. And in fact, our crew, Paolo and I, undocked during STS-134. So it's really kind of a busy, busy time. And I think it speaks to what we're doing right now at NASA with commercial crew, because candidly, getting people up and down to the space station is, is doable. And it's the right time for the commercial companies, you know, with our help, so that nobody's reinventing the wheel, to be doing that kind of process. And the people, the crew on the station, is focusing on doing the experiments that are coming up and down on those supply ships. So it's a very exciting time, but you'll find it's a little confusing when you see all the people. You wonder if we're all just waving goodbye all the time. <laughs> you know, while we're talking about the patches, too, if you look at the uh, Expedition 28 patch, the 50 on the bottom has uh, the name Gagarin and Shepard with it, too. And, and the other part of history we got to witness was the 50th anniversary of the first human in space, Yuri Gagarin, mm -hmm. and, the, and the 50th anniversary of the first American in space, Alan Shepard. And uh, um, my Russian crewmates and I launched from, and actually all these guys launched from the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin launched from, and uh, we launched very close to the, that 50th anniversary. So the name of our rocket was Gagarin, and the name of our spacecraft was Gagarin. So I thought that was a, a pretty good tribute, being that all of us were born at the height of the Cold War, and I was born in the same year that uh, Yuri Gagarin uh, launched into space. I just thought it was amazing that 50 years later that we'd all be flying on, you know, with our Russian crewmates. In fact, I think you'll see a picture of uh, the six of us right. on April 12th celebrating in our own way up there on the space station, all wearing uh, T-shirts that Ron and his crew brought for us that have Yuri Gagarin's face on there. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the video. Again, this represents a, an entire year in space in about 14 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we go fast, but not that fast. Since I was first, I launched about two days after my uh, 50th birthday. And if you know my signature, you know I was a nervous sign in my door. Uh, it's, this is the place that we stay in Baikonur. And uh, we get, there's lots of really interesting Russian traditions. We get blessed by the Russian priest. Uh, we report to the Russian officials and they uh, give us a great send off there on the launch pad in Baikonur. And I can't tell you how amazing it is to. I mean, even looking at it, I just think, wow, I was in that very, very small yeah. thing. And actually, this is the part I loved about it, was being in a small Soyuz spacecraft so close to the Earth and yet uh, so far away as it's, well. It's easy for her to say. Look at her size. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is my favorite part of the whole movie, okay, even though you see my rear end. And, <laughs> but because it's not about floating around up in space, it's about flying. I mean, that place is huge. And here comes the, the Japanese supply ship that uh, HTV that uh, Paolo Nespoli and I were in charge of actually catching that with the robotic arm. So we're on the controls, reaching out, grabbing that thing. If you didn't read about it in the papers, it's because we did not mess it up. We're very <laughs> proud of that. And then uh, we just saw the, the European supply mission and, and that docks automatically with uh, Sasha uh, Caleri and Paolo shepherding. And now we have the arrival of STS-133. They are looking at us and we are looking at them. There's Nicole Stott rest of her crew, Steve Lindsay. And they, they brought up the MPLM, it's our giant closet. And it may sound trivial to you, but having a place to put things where things are not packed eight things deep um, is, is actually the key to doing science up there, is having enough space to actually operate. And their crew brought the MPLM, did the spacewalks to hook it all up, helped us unpack it and get it ready, and also brought us the Robonaut. And uh, this guy is really pretty cool. We we'll get him out to play later. But then uh, Scott and his crew, so I was up there with Scott Kelly and his two uh, Russian crewmates. Uh, they left. We had a little spare time. Got to do a little flute playing there. And, uh, and a lot of time for science, one of my favorite fluids experiments there. And it's Ronnie on board. Yeah, it was fun opening up the hatch and uh, seeing these guys on the other side. Uh, we had to get acclimated really quickly, though, because, um, well, for, first of all, we were going to celebrate the... Uh, the uh, 50th anniversary of the first human space flight right after we, we arrived, and that's, that, that's us uh, celebrating that. But then we had the uh, arrival of SGS-134. Here's us all in our crew quarters, our respected crew quarters. And here comes um, Spatial Endeavor coming aboard. That's the view that they had of us when they came aboard. They brought the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. This is this instrument that 
basically helps us look at dark energy and dark matter. Things that we didn't know a lot about and are learning more, even, I mean, already today that thing is working. Um, we also, because we had Paolo Nespoli and Roberto Vittori on board, two Italians, um, the Pope uh, got arranged a conference. We were all pretty excited about that. I, excited about that and about the fact that Roberto brought really good Italian food. <laughs> And I love this picture of the station and the shuttle docked. Mm -hmm. Just, it's a representation of the work that everybody here has done to create an outpost space where people can live and work and do, I think, just simply amazing things. I didn't actually want to come home. Um, I mean, eventually I did want to come home, but I would have stayed uh, six months longer in a minute because there's just so much good work to do. It takes you a while to get good at it. But then uh, sooner or later it's time to leave. And uh, as they were undocking, Paulo uh, and Katie and Dima took these amazing pictures of uh, Special Endeavor dock to the, to the space station. It was, uh, it was sad to see those guys leave. They abandoned us uh, in the middle of the mission. In yeah. the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> and they just snuck out and they were gone. But um, it, it was a very busy mission. Uh, they did four spacewalks uh, and delivered tons of equipment. And uh, here's, here's Katie returning to the Earth. You know, we've learned a lot about exercise and what we need to do to keep people, people healthy. It's part of our mission to use the space station to you know, make sure people can be healthy for exploring further. You know, I, I came back in, in great shape, as did these guys, and it's a tribute to what we've learned. Those lessons come right back here to Earth about osteoporosis, and unfortunately, I think the word is that basically we're all gonna have to exercise our whole lives <laughs> and eat healthy. So shortly after Katie left, uh, uh, and never left, um, and here comes Mike and, and the guys coming aboard. Just a few weeks later, it was a very busy time, a lot of tra traffic coming and going. So, you know, Mike traveled, he was two and a half days in the capsule, you know, he, launched, he went a million miles, launched from Russia, and he was a little upset with me because uh, all I had waiting for him was a bag of coffee, of instant coffee. Bag of instant coffee, travel a million miles. <laughs> it was great to get up there, though, and it, we did uh, have to jump right into it. We were on the road to 135, preparing for Atlantis, as well as, you know, getting, getting to work ourselves and uh, um, uh, cleaning up some of the messes. Uh, and uh, hey. It, it's hey. Hey, hey, hey. it was uh, it, I mean it's it's always amazing and uh, finally I think about five weeks after we got there Atlantis was uh, coming aboard it was uh, great to uh, have this view of Atlantis and I think Ron got that picture there you know it's like a hurricane when a shuttle arrives I mean in that there is so much work to do in such a short amount of time and it's amazing when a team comes together like this and does it. And Mike and I got to do our uh, fourth spacewalk together on that mission. We got to do the, uh, the one spacewalk on 135, and it was, uh, it was great getting out the door. Um, it was kind of like going in your, out in your backyard after being in space that long. It, we, uh, we brought the uh, broken pump module home on board Atlantis, and we moved a, a remote refueling mission, RRM, payload to the, uh, out from the cargo bay to the outside of the station. Uh, and Ron and I just found out last week we hold the record for the two people with the most spacewalk time together. Oh. It's kind of cool. I love this picture. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's a lot of work. Uh, and we had, of course, huge support from the uh, 135 crew. And we're fortunate that, uh, that we were able to, you know, called on to do the spacewalk for that time. So, you know, when that mission was over, we got to ring the bell and signify the uh, departure of Atlantis, but also the departure of the space shuttles from... I think of that arm there as a salute Yeah, as it backs away from the station. It was kind of a bittersweet time for us. Yep. Got kind of quiet after that. Back in August, though, about a, a month before uh, I returned, I was, I was in the cupola. That's that windowed observatory on the bottom of the space station. And um, I was getting set up to take some pictures for some of the time-lapse photography that I think you'll see later in the video. Uh, Mike was doing a lot of that as well. And I was getting ready to delete the practice shots when something caught my eye. This, this bright illuminated line snaked across hundreds of miles across a large landmass. And initially, I wrote that off as, you know, just strange reflection of moonlight on a, uh, on a river. But it turns out that that wasn't a natural reflection at all. You know, m many of us say you can't see any borders from space, but apparently we're wrong because that was actually the man-made illuminated border between India and Pakistan. And seeing that had a, had a really big impact on me because, you know, for the 50 years that we've been flying in space, astronauts and cosmonauts have commented on how beautiful, how peaceful, how fragile the Earth looks from space. And it, you know, these are not cliches that, that astronauts say because it feels good. It really is moving 
to, to look down on Earth. But I, I think the, the point is not whether we could look down and see a, a man-made border between India and Pakistan. The point is that we could look down at that same area and feel empathy for the struggles that all people face. You know, we could look down and, and see this beautiful planet that we've been given and realize that we're you know, all riding through the universe together on the spaceship that we call Earth. But after five and a half months on board, it was, uh, it was time to say goodbye to our friends, uh, say goodbye to our home on the ISS. And it, you know, again, it was, it was very bittersweet. And uh, we wanted to savor our last moments in space as we uh, undocked and, and did a couple of laps around our planet. And uh, this is some of the uh, time-lapse photography that, uh, that we took. There's the, uh, the Black Sea right there. This is a new way of doing photography up there that these guys actually perfected of doing time lapse photography and getting to see what it, getting to see this. The, and to me, this is the way that you get to see what it was like for us up there and how it felt to be going around the earth not actually this fast. It's sped up for, you know, those uh, time lapse, but it's we're just amazing. Really excited about that one because we can finally share it with you. We we see all these amazing things and we know that the camera is not going to capture it and we don't have the words. We're engineers and scientists. We don't have the words to really describe it. Watch the moon rise and the moon's reflection here. Just just as New Zealand just went by on the right. It's it's, uh, it's really stunning. So it's uh, it's a lot of fun to be able to capture this. And this wasn't official work. This is all you know, kind of free time and weekends trying to figure out how to get things right and then get sequences of photos that we can string together to make these videos. And uh, we're we're excited because this allows us to share it. And there's Ronnie coming home. Looks bad. You know, it looks bad, but I mean, it, it, this is physics. This is physics in action, and it works. <laughs> but that left things a little quieter on board because there was a, a, some delays in the Soyuz uh, line at that time. So we had a crew of three for a couple of months during Expedition 29. We were able to get Robonaut out and put him to work through some of his paces here. He's the first humanoid robot in space. That's the one on the left. <laughs> And uh, so it, it was a little quieter, but we were able to participate in a lot of the experiments. Uh, we, uh, we were up to full speed by then, and so we were, uh, you know, working very effectively and managed to keep things going. You exercise with uh, bungee cords holding you to the treadmill. A shower doesn't work, so you wash up with uh, just a washcloth and soapy water. Uh, going to bed means climbing into your sleeping bag that's stacked to the wall. There's no reason to lay it out any flatter than that, because it's the uh, wall works as good as the floor or anywhere else. You're maintaining systems at the same time um, uh, and uh, experiments. A cargo ship means fresh things like onions, which uh, we're eating like apples. I know it seems weird, but it's a taste of Earth. The free time was spent in that cupola, the amazing uh, window cluster on the bottom of the station. Here's what it looks like when you're doing a reboost on the station. And uh, when we let go, we're at a constant speed. The station is accelerating away from us. Watch, Sergey. It's kind of cool. Here's uh, Satoshi Furukawa demonstrating his uh, baseball skills with a one-man team, uh, both teams. One man playing baseball. Got to pitch it. Nice pitch, Satoshi. Now he's got to go faster than the pitched ball. It's a little easier in space than it is on the ground. Grab the bat. Let's go. Batter up. <laughs> Oh, he got it. It's a hit. It's a pop fly. Can he feel that ball? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see it. There it is. Fair catch. <laughs> and this is what I meant about flying up there. It's not about floating around. It's about a, a whole new world to, to live and work in because all our experiments can take advantage of this weightlessness as well. Oh, midair. <laughs> the experiments are a little better, I think. <laughs> Finally, in uh, November, mid-November, the uh, Expedition uh, uh, 30 crew, Dan Burbank and his crewmates, uh, came aboard. We just had six days with them. The, not counting the day they arrived and left, we had four days to hand over the entire space station. We did our best. Uh, they're a great crew. They are up there today, and they were joined by the next crew of, uh, about a month later. So it was uh, after, uh, I think we didn't sleep for the four days we were really working and handing over. It's time for us to uh, climb aboard our Soyuz spacecraft and uh, get the hatches closed and do all the leak checks and stuff to begin our journey toward home. It was uh, really amazing to, as we backed away from the station, looking out the window to see, the, uh, to see it growing dim. And here's, here we are coming home inside a meteor. We're actually the little dot in the middle of the screen, and the two uh, throwaway parts of the Soyuz are burning up behind us. That, that had never been seen before because we landed before dawn here. 
and uh, in an unusual, um, kind of unusual, but that was uh, dictated by us delaying a little bit so we could greet the other crew and hand over. That's the whole spacecraft. Bill Ingalls, it's right here, he's got that photograph. amazing photo. And then uh, we, of course, participate in the uh, funny hat ceremony. <clears throat> The works just don't do it justice. It's uh, it's you know been an amazing uh, amazing trip. That was, that was a year on the ISS. Yep. Okay. Well, we have time for questions. Uh, and as the moderator, I'm going to do the moderator's prerogative to start off. Okay. Uh, for those of us in the field of communications, what can we do to help you all tell the stories of space station better? Um, I, I think the public doesn't have a good appreciation for the fact that it's up there all the time. It's been up there for over 10 years. And what can we do to help get that word out more? What can we do to help you? Well, you know, I think that the whole playing field uh, in that regard has changed. In, in the past, I think the public had, you know, followed along on space missions as spectators. And I think we have the opportunity now through a lot of the, the new technology that we have is to have the public along as fellow crew members. And a lot of the interactive things like, like Twitter and Facebook and, and Google Plus and all these other platforms enable us to have not only real contact uh, with people on the ground when we're in space, but actually collaborate with them. Uh, I know that on Twitter, um, I was sending pictures down to some of the friends I met on Twitter, and they were helping me identify them. And so that when I sent them out, you know, I could, uh, it's, it's more interesting when you send out a really cool picture to know where that was and to maybe tell something about it. But we don't always have the time on board. You know, we're very busy with uh, all the experiments that we're doing, so it's, it's really good to have uh, that support from the public. And, and again, I'm not, I don't mean just as spectators. I mean, there, there really is a, a valid, important role that the public can serve in helping uh, us uh, to tell a story a little bit better. And a lot of the technology that we have, as far as the cameras that you see, um, one of our, and I think we all share this, and I think the guys on board now share this too, is, is we don't want to just take the same pictures you can see from a satellite. We've got humans in space for a reason, you know, for many reasons. One of them is that we can share the emotion of, of, of that too. And so, you know, a lot of us try and in, include those type of emotional things uh, in, the, in the pictures that we take and the time-lapse photography. Uh, the, when you see the time-lapse photography, that, that gives a whole new uh, element to it. You know, maybe certain camera angles, uh, certain times of the day where you can see shadows being cast on the horizon. You know, those are things that really help us to to you know, show the emotion of, of living and working in space, and I think it, uh, it goes a long way. Okay, questions from the yeah. audience? Don't be bashful. We don't get them here that often. Uh, low rain. Um, since you all had both um, launched on the space shuttle and landed in the Soyuz capsule, what is the difference? I mean, I know it's, it has to be dramatic, the landings in the Soyuz rather than the nice smooth landing of the space shuttle? Well, I'd say the, the, the shuttle, of course, is a nice smooth landing. And there's times when you're not even completely certain what the point of touchdown might have been. I, I, I like to joke that they're all good Air Force landings, none of those <laughs> Navy landings. <laughs> uh, the, uh, with the Soyuz, there's uh, very little doubt when you touch down. Um, just a few feet above the ground. I mean, you're coming down on the parachute. You're coming down, you know, over land. A few feet above the ground, the soft landing rockets uh, ignite to uh, begin to, uh, you know, decelerate and cushion. And I felt those kick in. You can you can kind of feel them, hear them, because it's an explosion going on right behind your back. Um, but it, it I, I couldn't say how much of a difference they make. But it's a it's a significant, um, uh, you know, event. The touchdown. It's very dynamic. But you know the system's doing its job, and and uh, there's there's uh, energy absorption uh, uh, mechanisms built into you know the, just the design of the capsule and the seat structure and the struts holding it up are, are all giving a little bit to help absorb that energy. And you're in a custom molded seat liner. You know the the, the on the shuttle it's a, it's a big generic seat. Um, here you're actually laying on your back in a seat pan, and that mold has been form-fitted to your body just to help give you really good uh, support, similar to the kind of uh, support that NASCAR uh, drivers and stuff have to, uh, to help protect them against you know, similar kind of energies and for, a, for an impact for them. I think the 
parachute opening is actually something, it's not that it's unexpected because of course, you know, we've all been trained and talk about things, but people think about the landing, but when that parachute opens, oh, yeah. that is a very violent event. And I actually had a little timer yeah. counting down to that. And so you're just, you know, coming along and pulling G's and just kind of all ready and making sure that you're just ready. And then suddenly that happens and that thing is swinging and spinning yep. and it's, it's like the most amazing, uh, you know, roller coaster ride you've ever been on. And I like what Mike, uh, what Mike sometimes says, or I've heard him say, um, which is that um, as long as actually these really violent events are really good if they're planned. And it's actually when you don't have any violent events that you begin to worry. Yeah. It's time. Where is it? <laughs> Where's our violent event? <laughs> it should be a parachute opening here. I think Scott, Scott Kelly uh, used to say it's like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel on fire, followed by a head on collision. Right. <laughs> For us, we, we came in uh, pre-dawn, and so we really got to experience the plasma, uh, the plasma ball riding home in the meteor. They saw our plasma trail. We, we dig in at uh, over 4 Gs, and the shuttle is about 1.4, um, so it's a much shallower entry, and we're coming in pretty steep. The chase helicopters actually saw our plasma trail, which is you know had never been seen before. It was really cool from from. You know our perspective because you know you see the, the orange pink glow outside and all, and the the heat shield on the Soyuz capsule isn't a blader it burns away carrying heat with it and so there's this incredible incandescent stream of irregular sparks and pieces coming off of that going by my window I hope hope that's normal yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I, I, th I think in a nutshell you know riding the shuttle is this big massive vehicle that you ride inside and the Soyuz is, is kind of a vehicle that you that you wear it feels like <laughs> Every pump that comes on, every valve that opens, every you know explosive bolt that fires, you you feel all that stuff, and it's it's a really neat experience. Yeah, Katie, um, how much time do you spend actually doing experiments on during the day on a mission? And a two-part question. And and there was this gizmo you were pushing against the wall. I saw it, it twice. What was that, and what was the purpose of that experiment? Well, officially, we get up at six and we go to bed at ten. And I'm sure 30. we did that every night. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, but, you know, most of us probably work, you know, really more like a 12-hour day or so. And it's always divided in some way between, you know, systems maintenance and uh, experiments. And I think uh, they're aiming for, do you guys know the number of uh, utilization hours they're aiming for these days? Th 35. 30, 35 hours of experiment kind of stuff uh, every week. And so that's really quite a lot. Um, and yet when system stuff comes up, you know, then that's what, I mean, if something breaks, you have to, to do that. But to me, what's really fascinating is that, you know, we've built this station. It's got a series of facilities. These are like refrigerator sized, you know, racks where it's not a place where you can do just one experiment, but a series of experiments. And so, you know, after one experiment finishes or maybe goes, maybe it goes well, maybe has unexpected things, you know, the next experiment can either automatically get inserted there or maybe we're changing out the hardware so the new uh, experiment can be done. So it's just a series of over and over again doing different experiments, but in the same mm -hmm. hardware. And so it's it's very efficient in that way, because meanwhile, the results are coming down to the ground in the form of video and data all the time to the scientists all over the world. Results are being analyzed, and the experiments are being changed in real time. And so that's an exciting process to be a part of. You know, personally, as a polymer chemist, I love the things where I actually get to do things. And yet, really, the fact that science is going on 24 hours a day up there, even while I'm sleeping or supposed to be sleeping, is, is an amazing thing that we've done. And coming from my, my two shuttle missions, one of them was a lab mission, SDS-73, 16 days of science experiments. And the purpose of that mission was to figure out how to do experiments on the space station. And in fact, if you look at that 73 patch, you'll see a sort of uh, soccer ball sort of geometry shape. And that was the shape of the cupola to represent the space station, which was the future of these experiments. And I go up there, and one of the things we needed to figure out was how do we get not just one scientist's data down at the one time, but, you know, many and really detailed data, <clears throat> excuse me, and a lot of, you know, a lot of bandwidth. And that's one of the things that we've done, I think, quite well and are still working to do even better so that, you know, these early shuttle missions uh, set the stage for what happens every single day up there. The specific experiment that you asked about was getting weighed, which was kind of fun. You know, when you think about it, um, it's going to take more force to push one of these guys around than it's going to take to push one right. of me around. And so we have a, a, th a thing that we kind of perch on and try to be real still and hold our feet and hands and everything in. 
And, uh, and then we, we push a little button on the computer, get real still, and it pulls us into the rack. And then it, it, it measures the force it takes to do that, and that'll tell us our weight, so to speak. And so we can judge how people are doing up there and whether they're eating all the, the wonderful food. Yeah. Is flying a good weight loss uh, You know, if I was on a, it was a government program. We had exercise. We had food. I had a place to stay. It was like going to the best, uh, the best outer space spa you can think of. <laughs> the spa, but, you know, <laughs> <different> program. <laughs> yeah, I, I won't say we did spa-like activities, but <laughs> it was good for weight loss. Uh, question. Okay. Yes, my question is, you mentioned about exercising when you're up there. How do you like stay motivated? Do you have like, is that part of your schedule? Yeah, well, it is part of our schedule. We're scheduled for two hours of, of physical training every day. And actually, it's, we really look forward to it. I mean, it really feels good to, to exercise uh, in space. And so it, because um, you feel so much better afterwards. When you don't exercise, and there were times um, during our missions where you get so busy that you just can't do it, uh, and then you start to feel bad after a while. So it, it really is a, a self-motivating thing. And the, what we're doing them for, uh, like Katie said, is for countermeasures, and countermeasures for, to combat uh, bone loss, muscle atrophy, et cetera, and it does a tremendous job. Um, I, I felt probably as good after being almost six months in space uh, when I came back as I did after two weeks in space on my space shuttle mission because of the exercise uh, programs and the countermeasure programs that we have. And what's exciting to me about that, um, you know, understanding how to stay in shape. I mean, I said spa, but, you know, we actually worked, I think, as you know, really, really hard up there. And the exercise part, I mean, I'm just like everybody else probably in this audience where you go, oh, I should do that today. And it's hard to work it in down here. But up there, it's part of what you're supposed to do. And you really do feel badly if you don't do it. But what's amazing is while we're taking care of ourselves, we're also serving as really important data for experiments to come right back here to Earth. Our bone loss rate um, would typically be about 10 times the rate of a 70-year-old woman that has osteoporosis, 10 times. And so mm -hmm. the fact that the experiment progresses so quickly makes it measurable. So we're doing lots of different data collections, both blood and urine and different things. Um, some of us use different uh, drugs to understand how those drugs work. And because that process of both, you know, losing bone mass and actually rebuilding, because they're actually always competing uh, mm -hmm. processes, because that's happening so fast, it makes it easier to measure. And that knowledge comes right back down here to earth to understand those processes. And in fact, um, you know, even though I can only speak for my own personal um, data, but I, I actually had the same amount of physical bone as what I left with. It doesn't mean that my bones are the same, though. And it's important to understand that process. And what we do up there helps us understand that, that, you know, if your bone is a pipe, I probably have lost some out of the meaty middle of that pipe, but the pipe came back a little bit thicker. And understanding those things for people who are 70 and might have a lot of competing physical processes going on, I think is, is really valuable. Any other? Over here. I know that Sioux Falls is a rather large town in South Dakota because I am from Whitewood, which is a rather small town. Where did you find or did you find any inspiration for this career in the middle of South Dakota? And my second question is, are you involved in any activities to then go back and provide some inspiration for the younger kids that are there today? Sure. A hey, great question. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a, it actually is a very personal question. My grandfather was a homesteader in the Watertown area at the turn of the century, the last century. And so, you know, and so I, I really like to say that, the, you know, that the pioneering spirit, you know, that, that really opened up South Dakota is still alive today. And that's true really for our, for our country. And that, that pioneering spirit, the, the desire to know what's out there and to go and tame it, conquer it, and uh, learn to live and thrive uh, is out there, wherever out there is. And, and 100 years ago, that meant moving west. And now it means moving up, moving down, maybe into our oceans. Uh, and, and so that, that spirit is one of the things that's made our country great. And I think that that's really exemplified by the, the pioneers that endured the hardships and the loneliness and the separation from family as they went out to try to carve out a better way of life. Uh, and a part of our job is to go out and, and share the story. Uh, you know, I, you know, I think we all came from improbable backgrounds for the career we're in now, but we were captured by the dream of doing this 
most outrageous of uh, humankind's uh, adventures and participating in it. In a, in, uh, and that, that dream is still alive, too. And there's uh, uh, many opportunities in the future. And I, I think that there will be more opportunities for people to, to fly in space and to participate in the breakthroughs that come as we're, we've gone from just figuring out how to build something up there. And now we're, we're involved in the utilization and getting into the science and finding a lot of different things that we can affect in, in materials, in medicines, in health. And there's, there's more discoveries waiting for us. Katie, I noticed you had your flutes in the video. Did you have a chance? Uh, I, I believe you had a duet with Ian Anderson. Did you have a chance to rehearse beforehand with him? And uh, <laughs> how often did you play up uh, on the station? Uh, I didn't play as often as I'd like. I played often, you know, kind of at night, probably after that bedtime. Um, and often in the cupola because, A, the view simply amazing both day and, and night. And B, it was in the middle of the station, and I was actually just sure that it wouldn't wake anybody up. Really? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, uh, I, did, I actually didn't even get to meet Ian Anderson until I got home. And I did actually get to play with him on stage uh, in concert <clears throat> over in Italy. I'll tell you, that was totally terrifying. And <laughs> I mean, I'm not worried about going to space, but that was really... It was a rocket I was very, any time. <laughs> I was very nervous. Um, and actually... It, to me, the fact that I, I like I like the flute things because I think it shows everybody that we live up there. We meaning the three of us here, but we meaning just people from our planet are living in a place that is not on the surface of the planet, and they're doing normal things like I happen to play the flute. And uh, actually, the two other flutes that you saw um, were in that picture um, are Irish. There's a tin whistle uh, and an, an Irish flute that's about 150 years old from uh, musicians in the Chieftains. And they're actually about to um, have an album come out where they actually use the music from that tin whistle in one of their songs just to show that music is everywhere. And, you know, they have about 20 guest artists on that, uh, on that album. But we, meaning, you know, you who make all this possible and me who was playing and somebody who captured that and brought it down and sent it off. I mean, it's all part of the whole big puzzle in the whole big picture of what we do. So we are on an album that shows that music is everywhere. Yes. I'd like to uh, expand that question a little bit for all three of you. Yes, you are living there. And Colonel Coleman got to play your flute what other kinds of hobbies are you able or capable of pursuing up on station? I don't see you playing much golf like Alan Shepard did on the moon. And the I baseball don't... games get kind of short. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So what else can you guys do up there for fun? Well, um, we, we have an, a number of musical instruments up there. We have a keyboard. We have a guitar. Um, but, but really... And Ron plays the guitar. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> he does. No, all three chords. Um, you know, you're, you realize that you're in a very, very special place. And I think the biggest, I don't know if I want to call it a hobby, but, you know, just basically looking out the window and trying to capture yeah. what, what's out the window for everybody on the, on the earth, I think, is, uh, is what uh, we spent, whatever little spare time we had, that was the majority of it, was, was trying to do that. Because that is very rewarding. Because it, it almost seems like when you're looking at something that's just breathtaking and it's hard to describe, it, it's... It's frustrating not to be able to share that, and so um, luckily, or not luckily, but fortunately, we have uh, some great equipment on board now that we can start to, to capture just a little bit of that, and it's uh, that I found, and I think everybody shares yeah. that, very re re rewarding, and, and so that's what uh, we spend most of our spare time doing. Well, for me, I was in the cupola watching, just taking a break during uh, the Atlantis Dock Mission 135 with uh, Sandy Magnus, who had previously lived on the station, but the cupola wasn't there yet. When she, so she was enjoying this, this new view in the few days that she had to visit her old home. And we went through this amazing aurora bloom, and, which I had not yet seen. And it, it, it was so stunning. And I said, OK, I am going to figure out how to capture this. I knew we had cameras that would work, could capture low light. And I, that, was, that became a mission uh, to try to do that so we could share it with you. 
Um, uh, the other thing you, you, you mentioned, we, we all do, you know, bring our hobbies and interests. For me, a big one's Boy Scouting. I'm a scoutmaster of a Boy Scout troop in Houston. I'm active at the council level and a few committees at the national level. And so I, you know, maintain my ties with my troop. I had an acting scoutmaster, but I did a scoutmaster's conference with every one of the boys in my troop, which is one of the steps along the, as part of the rank progression. So I had a, you know, one-on-one -on -one, you know, phone call with each one of the boys. One of them, one of the boys' father had previously served on the station, so I called Matthew up and I said, it's probably not a big deal for you to talk to somebody in space, is it? He said, oh, actually it kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> So that was, that was fun, and I was able to send messages to uh, scout camps around the country, uh, several of them that I have ties to, and just have a little fun, share the experience in uh, very unusual ways. I did a, actually a live event with the scout camp that I attended as a youth and served on the staff, uh, that, where I had served as a staff member uh, in my high school years. So that was a, a lot of fun for me to be able to do that, and there were, you know, you know, you know what those, those kind of organizations are like. There's some of the old boys that are still around. And so they were, they were out there for that, to take part in that. And I, I got to, you know, to reach out and, and you, know, you know, in ways to a, a, you know, a segment of the community that we don't normally get to talk to. And that was just my little niche. You know, we've talked a couple times about the cupola and looking out from that. And it, it's a really different place than we've ever had up there in that most of our windows are kind of like portals. And so they're just, they're you know, usually circular. And you look out and the earth is just going by quickly. And if you just kind of look out your, the, the side window of your car and just look, look like this, you know, you'll see things going by really fast. You have to sort of know what's coming and figure out where you are. And now the fact that we have windows, you know, here, here, all the way around us, you know, we're, we're almost a part of the view. And, and the reason I bring this up to you is that years and years ago, as a NASA community, we had to decide, are we going to have a cupola? Mm -hmm. Are we going to have a, a module that has... Windows. I mean, there's a lot of engineering, you know, nuances that we're adding in. Windows are hard. That are not, uh, is it physically necessary in order to have a space station to have this it. module that is maybe not very big and has windows and they could leak or they could, I mean, all those concerns. But it's everything you hear about because it's part of the human experience of being up there. And as we march forward here, and you know we're handing off getting people and stuff up to space to those commercial companies and we are focusing on going further realize that you know together with a robotic presence that's how we're going to get there but in the end what we're doing is extending the human presence and we mm -hmm. have to make sure that we're building vehicles and you know places that bring the, allow us to have those human experiences NASA has a uh, space act agreement with Lego. Uh, didn't Katie? Didn't you get to play with the Legos up there? Uh, not nearly enough. <laughs> oh. You know, I actually, I have an 11 year old that lives for Lego, and in fact, we we actually um, because you know we train. We never do anything in NASA unless we practice. And so they sent me the Lego space station, and he and I, who is, and he's a much better Lego builder than I am, right? Um, he and I built it and then actually sent them some critiques like, hey, this part here is not going to work. And, uh, and it would have been real. I did you not get to build it. Expert. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and so Mike actually, I think, got to build it There's up there. Satoshi, Satoshi. got to do more yeah. of it than I did. Yeah. But, you know, it, it just, it, it's, again, something that brings home the fact that people are living up there. And I love, you know, these kinds of activities for kids where they think, I'm envisioning something and now I'm going to build it. And they do. Mm -hmm. And whether it's robotics or Lego or, I mean, all these kinds of things that get our young people th feeling empowered and feeling like the future is actually possible and they'd better be ready for it. And that's part of what we do here, too. And uh, so doing Lego was, was pretty fun. We did a little Sesame Street as well. Prior to... Uh, Ron and I are 10. <laughs> we counted 10. <laughs> Prior to some of the last shuttle launches and some of the ELV launches... Uh, Lego would set up at the Kennedy Space Visitor Center in, uh, in the big IMAX theater building there, and they would come and throw piles of hundreds of thousands of Legos right. in 10 piles around the room, and then we'd have students be able to come in with their parents, we'd have astronauts there to help with them, and they would dive in and they'd have 45 minutes to launch the future. And, and I would have a hard time building a little kit with instructions. These kids dive in, 
find all the pieces that they need and then make the most remarkable spacecraft, airplanes, space stations. It's really yeah. is something to watch. It, it gives you great hope about the future of creativity. Yeah, future engineers start future with Legos. Future engineers, right. They start right. with Legos. Yeah. Uh, we've got about eight minutes left. Any other questions? I think Beth Beck is right tweet, up here. tweeting that last thing. Oh, right over here. We'll have our future scientists and engineers. What do you do when you get sick in space? That's a really good question. What do you do when you get sick in space? We have, uh, I mean, we're, some of us are trained, I think most of us are trained as crew medical officers. We have quite a, uh, you know, quite a big first aid kit that goes beyond first aid to actually taking care of more serious things if we need to. Uh, but, you know, you're, so you're ready to handle. Um, bumps and bruises. I got to use a little dermabond, which is kind of like super glue you can use for medical things when uh, one, of my, one of the crew had a little injury and I got to use that to help because, you know, stitches would be just real messy and hard for everybody. So you can actually use this dermabond like super glue to close up a wound. I got to do that. That was the most significant thing I did. I'm glad we didn't do anything more. The, the other thing that we use the space station for is to, to try and develop um, those medical procedures that will need if we go to the moon, if we go to Mars, uh, and not only in space missions, but also undersea missions as well. Uh, we have a, a mission called NEMO where we spend weeks on the bottom of the ocean and we work on uh, telementoring, uh, telemedicine, telerobotic surgery, and uh, I was on a mission actually in 2006 where we had a surgeon in Canada uh, operating a robotic, a, a surgical robot that was with us on the bottom of the ocean um, and so, this, you know, this is technology that will help us when we go to the moon, will help us when we go to Mars, but it will also help anywhere in the world that does not have access to a major medical center when we make this telerobotic surgery, this, te this telementoring, telemedicine. These are all things that uh, really uh, can make life better on planet Earth. I mean, so that means, like, places where there's a really wide expanse of geography where you can't have, you know, a uh, laparoscopic surgeon, you know, right there, but maybe you can have that equipment and a doctor in a helicopter, you know, getting out there. Um, but it, it's, it also is, enables folks to uh, teach the practice of medicine. The video associated with this telerobotic kind of surgery allows more surgeons to be trained. But something I just learned about this week is that the technology that uh, was used to develop the robotic arms on the space station up in Canada, that same technology is yeah. being applied to doing surgery inside an MRI, where of course you can't have metal, metal and things, but brain surgery inside the MRI, in that in the MRI you can see what really needs done, and by having the right instruments made out of the right stuff that could actually do the surgery, then they're able to actually really understand exactly locally yeah. where they're supposed to be operating, and I think that's a fairly new development. So it all adds up, and it's pretty neat. We have time for one last question because we have a hard cutoff because there's a show coming up after this about the space station. I think actually they're transmitting down. So, yeah, you guys spent if you went up and came back in a Soyuz by three days total on a very very small. We're obviously more familiar with the shuttle. What what, what is that like? I mean, can you even get out of your seat? Yes, you can. The part that we launch and land in is a capsule. Uh, that's very, very small, and that's what you saw sitting on the ground that we, uh, or hanging under the parachute. Um, the, the, on orbit, we have another small module just on top of that. Uh, it's called an orbit module that there's, has a, a, a significantly more room for the crew to get into and to get out of the suits and stretch out a little bit. So that it's a kind of rudimentary living conditions, but there, you know, there is a toilet. Uh, and there's some, you know, there's some room. It would in be windows. intolerable to stay in the capsule uh, for for more than a few hours. At, at the end of the time we were in there, my knees are screaming. I need to stretch out because <laughs> you're 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 in there on your back with your knees pulled toward your chest and then strapped down just to keep everything nice and stable, uh, just in case you know, because every launch could turn into an immediate landing, and you're prepared for that possibility. So you, you get a chance to stretch out. One of the neat things or strange things about the Soyuz 2 is they put it in a spin. It to, it's a very simple way to keep the solar arrays pointed at the sun. And so that you get in and you get the arrays pointed at the sun, and then you put the whole thing into a spin about one revolution every two minutes. 
and, and uh, so you're watching out of the window and, and just kind of watching as your, your spacecraft is somersaulting around the planet. It almost feels like you're on a leaf tumbling around the planet for oh, two days. Oh, that's great, yeah. It was just really, really neat experience. It was very comfortable. It was, it was not fun. Okay. Well, I hope you all see that the human space fl uh, flight program is alive and well at NASA. Uh, incidentally, on our recent uh, astronaut application opportunity, we had the second highest number of applicants that we've ever had, over 6,000 uh, applicants. So somebody thinks we're still doing stuff, and I think that's great. I want to give a shout out to our colleagues at NASA TV who have been filming this today so that you can enjoy it again later. They'll use some of this footage in This Week at NASA. If you've not watched that show, you should, and you should tell your friends about it because you start to see the incredible range of things the agency does at all of our centers across the country and how we bring value to the public. Um, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back here when Don Pettit returns later this year for, uh, to hear about what he did on the space station. And uh, so let's give a final round of applause to Mike Fossum, Katie Coleman, and Ron Garrett. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you in orbit.